uh, to another how things are going to be, and I wouldn't change it for anything. Amen? Amen. Um, the Lord constantly surprises us anyway, so, um, hey, let, let, let's keep it rolling, right? All right. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Let me yank this mic down a little bit. I'm getting some feedback here. Um, we, uh, we got a big, big event coming up. Last week I talked about it a little bit. And uh, this will not be pulled, out, uh, pulled off without everybody jumping in and doing whatever you can. And you might think, well, I can't. I promise you can. Uh, so Fall Festival, October 16th, that's now uh, a little less than two weeks away, three to five, right here on the property. Lots of, uh, lots of great uh, activities are going to be taking place. Uh, there are three sign-up sheets in the foyer. So uh, if there's a particular activity maybe that you might be a little more leaning toward, I I'm sure that uh, we can uh, accommodate that. Maybe there's one thing that you like a little more than another. We, we, can, uh, we can help out with that. Uh, we need people to pray people to talk to our guests who are here, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, so and you, might, you might say, well, this, isn't this a uh, kid's event? I'm not that great with kids. Uh, I guarantee you smile, show a little love, you're a lot better with kids than you thought. So anyway, uh, this is an outreach project. We really want to reach our community through this. And th this is an opportunity they will come when uh, they won't come into a worship service. And we have a prime opportunity to show them the love of Christ. And that's our goal. Well, will we like them to come to our church? Absolutely. But if they don't, they've had a gospel encounter, and that's our primary goal. Uh, that they go away seeing the love of Jesus, hearing the love of Jesus, Having a gospel contact, that's really what we want to see. So, um, and maybe, just maybe, there are some people that you know who once sat in these seats, or maybe even have never sat in these seats before, who could help. Uh, we, my wife and I have some unchurched friends right now that love stuff like this, and maybe that would be a, connect, a way to get them in involved uh, so keep that in mind maybe you got a sister a brother a parent a friend somebody who can jump in because this is ultimately for the Lord for our community so let's think big so uh, Sue is there anything I need to add to that all right Linda you got a word okay All right, thank you. Uh, we got a lot going on here right now. And, uh, so, and I can't wait to see what's next around the corner. I know it's some good stuff. Uh, and the Lord keeps uh, unfolding all that before us. So uh, I'm, like I said, every week almost is a surprise. So I, I'm game for what's next. All right. Um, I think that covers it all. Uh, we got lots of our people this morning who would love to be here, but they are not feeling well. And out of an abundance of caution, they are staying at home. Uh, so be praying. Uh, be praying for them that what they are experiencing, will, they'll be healed soon. And they can be back with us. I know Elaine uh, Nolan's got another chemo treatment coming up uh, this coming, or uh, well, tomorrow, actually. So uh, be praying for her. Uh, that's the last one, I do believe. Uh, so then she has some other things around the corner. 
Uh, but lots of things we need to pray about. But I, as I always remind us, God is able. Amen. So we, we need to trust Him with our concerns, lay them at His feet, and, uh, and just know that God is working uh, for His glory. So let's pray. God, as we get into Your Word in a moment, we just uh, pray that You prepare our hearts, prepare our minds uh, for the truth that You have uh, before us. God, we thank you for what you're doing here in, in this church. We thank you for those who were baptized last Sunday, and we pray uh, for their continued growth. We pray that we would, as a church, would continue to surround them and uh, encourage them, disciple them in any way we can, uh, as you've called us to do. God, thank you for the things that are around the corner, for the fall festival. Um, and we, God, we pray for that. We pray for good weather. We pray for an abundance of volunteers. We pray that your spirit would be drawing people uh, here to that even now. And prepare our hearts to, uh, to be sensitive to how we can share the gospel with them, how we can uh, to reach out. Some of them are going to be coming onto this property and, and they have some major needs. They just need somebody to talk to. Uh, you, you'll open up opportunities for us to pray with people right here that day. So God, we are looking forward to that. We are praying in advance uh, just, for, uh, just for a special day uh, where we see spiritual fruit that uh, takes root in the hearts of people. God, we, uh, we pray for those who are sick right now, many uh, who would love to be here today. Uh, but just can't. And, and we pray for uh, your touch upon their bodies. We pray for Elaine as she goes in for uh, this chemo treatment tomorrow that all would go well, uh, no bad reactions, and uh, we just continue to see your touch upon her body as well. And God, you're so good to us. So we just want to say thank you. We love you. We give you all the honor and glory and praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, looking at the subject of the Lord's Supper. Uh, last week we celebrated baptism, and uh, praise God, I didn't drown anybody. Uh, everybody came up, and they're in good health today. In fact, they're all here, so uh, that's a good sign. I, I've never lost anybody yet in, in baptisms. And, uh, and I don't plan on it either, so <laughs> don't, don't get worried now. But uh, so it, it seemed just natural that after celebrating baptism last Sunday that we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, and we'll partake in that in just a few moments. But 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17. Here in 1 Corinthians, many of you... Uh, may remember the sermon that I preached several months ago about uh, nine ways to uh, ruin a church or something to that effect. Y'all remember that? Uh, very memorable. And I couldn't believe I preached 51 minutes and nobody left, nobody fell asleep. That, that was awesome. But if you remember from that message, the church at Corinth was one of the most messed up churches uh, in the Bible. And there, there are churches today that are very similar and, and have their struggles. But Paul is very direct. Uh, you, you, you might not see it so much here in chapter 11. Uh, there's something that's implied in the very final verse, and I'll make comment on that later. But these Corinthian believers, uh, they had a problem when it came to celebrating the Lord's Supper. Now, remember back in, uh, you know, right before Jesus was, uh, in fact, on the night he was betrayed, when, when Judas came and gave the kiss of betrayal, uh, he and his disciples, they celebrated the Lord's Supper for the first time. And in that, uh, you know, that was something he said, do in remembrance of me. So it was something that continued on and now, fast forward just a little bit, the Corinthian church has had a little too much fun with the Lord's Supper. Now, I'm, I'm going to make a confession as a little boy when I didn't understand what the Lord's Supper was all about. 
My grandma was the one that prepared it. Uh, we, in our church there in Virginia did it once a month. So grandma, would, she, she would always prepare the bread and uh, prepare the grape juice. And, you know, I said, Grandma, you know, I always look forward to the first Sunday of the month when we do the Lord's Supper because if I haven't had breakfast, it kind of ties me over until that's not the point. And, and, and the problem was that the Corinthian idea of the Lord's Supper was a whole lot worse than little Matthew's idea. So let, let me read the first few verses and kind of let you know what the problem was that these Corinthian believers had. Let's read verses 17 through 22 and then I'll kind of take it apart. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you. That sounds like the beginning of a motivational speech, doesn't it? Since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. But there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. I'm glad we have, we, we're not going to have that kind of Lord's Supper service today. Oh yeah, man, we had quite a time. Old Buck was plastered. Uh, not a good sign. What, verse 22, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Let's unpack this. Let's go back to verse 17. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. So, you, the, the way you're approaching this thing is all wrong. Verse 18, for first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And in part, I believe it. And there are also factions among you, verse 19, that those who are approved might be recognized among you. Now, as in any church, there is a division of rich and poor. Every church has some that have a little more money than others. And that's, that's just the natural part of life. But if any of us come to the point where we start showing off how much money we have, or how little money we have, or we use our abundance of money to mistreat those who have less money, we have a problem. A big, huge problem. And this was demonstrated because, let me back up, what they would do before the Lord's Supper is they would have these things called love feasts. And everybody would be bringing a, you know, some an abundance of food, some just a little bit of food. And... You know, for most churches, you know, that sounds great. Hey, we love to eat, don't we? But you got a problem when you got some that are bringing a whole bunch of food, and then you got some bringing a little bit of food who could probably bring more, and those who could bring more are eating more of the, uh, than their fair share. You've got a big, gluttonous meal coming on. Have you ever been to one of those? I, I hope not at a church. I hope not at this church. But I've been to some. I, I was at a church uh, gathering one time. I won't say where. But we invited some guests. And the, we always let the guests go first. And by the time the guests came through the line, there was hardly any food left over for anybody else. And we did it another year, and the same thing happened. And we did it another year, and the same thing happened, and people, start, they started getting upset. Now, that not being so much the same thing, but when you've got a big gluttonous feast before you come uh, to the Lord's table, and, and you reflect on His body and His blood that, uh, that was shed for you, you've got a problem. Some of you, you when, when you get invited places, 
You, you might eat five people's portions. I don't know. But when we, when we come in a gluttonous fashion, there's an issue. And some of us are not just gluttonous in food. And we have to examine our hearts. Hold on to that thought. Let's continue on. Verse 20. Therefore you come together in one place. It is not to eat the Lord's Supper. I mean, because they're gathering together, and I mean, you know, they got food, they got wine, and I mean, they're just having a good old time, and this celebration right here is the last thing on their minds. Verse 21, for in eating, each one takes his, sup his own supper ahead of others. They're not even considering their brothers and sisters in Christ around them. One is hungry and another's drunk. And then, in their drunkenness, they come to the Lord's table. Paul is not soft in how he addresses this. Because they come with such selfish ambition, each for his own. Then Paul says in verse 22, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? It's like if you're hungry, you're that hungry, eat at home. Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise this, you in this? I do not praise you. We see the problem. Bottom line was they had a just a misunderstanding of the Lord's Supper and what it meant. And, and really what it boils down to, when, when you have bad application, you better go, you got to trace it back to bad doctrine, bad belief system. If your practice is bad and the way you approach sin and the way you approach different things in life is all messed up, I guarantee it's because you have bad doctrine. And... If, if you have a bad view of God, a bad view of any particular area of Scripture, it's going to pour out in how you live. I mean, it's, it's just, that's just the way it is. So Paul then begins in correcting the problem. He has to go back and explain what the Lord's Supper is all about. So let's look now in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. He takes them back to the history of this. And I, and I, I did that just a moment ago. It began on the night that Christ was betrayed there by Judas and then handed over to be crucified. But he gave thanks and... And he let them know really three things here. That what he was instituting and what he was demonstrating that night, number one, was a memorial, or what they were going to do in remembering this, first of all, was to be a memorial of the past. Looking back, thanking God that Christ went to the cross, paid the price for our sin with his precious blood. I pray that any time we gather together, we come humbled by that reality. That we who were undeserving sinners, Christ paid the price for us and then invited us to come to Him and to be saved. Let's never get over that. Let it never be so commonplace and say, well, yeah, I'm saved. Praise God. Not going to hell, hallelujah. And then move on with our life. There is so, uh, we, we just have, we, we can't get over that. It, it can't become just something just ordinary to us. It's a memorial of the past, but it's a symbol 
for the present. Now some uh, doctrinal groups say that, oh, that when they give you the bread, that that becomes the body of Christ. That's not the case. Some say the juice, it becomes the blood of Christ. Not the case. It is a symbol. When he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood, which was shed for you. It was a picture, a symbol. Je Jesus gave all kinds of symbols and pictures throughout his ministry. And we must remember that that's exactly what's going on here. When he said, this is the cup, or this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new covenant between God and humanity was ratified in the blood of Christ. When he said that his body was broken, no, his bones were not broken on the cross, but his skin was torn immensely. The, the one thing that I can think about, how many of you ever saw the, the movie The Passion of the Christ? If there was any picture of how gruesome a death Christ died for us, it was that movie. And, and it touched my heart so deeply to think that He suffered that much for me, for you, for the entire world. There is not a single person that was left out when Christ died. That invitation is whosoever will. And if you're sitting here or you're watching today, I want to remind you, you're not too far gone. You might say, Matthew, you don't know what I've done. I don't need to know what you've done. Christ paid the price, and He invites you to come to Him and accept that free gift. Amen. And for that reason, I will continue to passionately plea week after week for people to come to Him and to know the pardon that comes through Him. So the explanation, but I want to go now into the examination. You know, I, I, could, I could just tell you right here and give you an explanation and say, okay, we're going to do it. But Paul here gives a, a call to examination, and I try to do my best every time I preach to do the very same thing. I can preach wonderful messages all day long, but if I don't call us to examine ourselves and to apply what the Word of God says, I have done you a great disservice. So here, we have a call to examination. Look at in verse 27. Let me back up for a minute. There's, there's something I missed out on here. In, 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 in the Lord's Supper being a memorial of the past and a symbol of the present, it was also a prophecy. Notice in verse 26. For often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. He's coming back. And with that in mind, we, we need to think about what he's done. Well, we need to think about there is a day that he's going to return. But now the examination, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Now, now keep that context of the love feasts in mind where these people were just gluttonously coming and, and having their, their meals before the Lord's Supper and eating too much, some even getting drunk. Keep that in mind as, as we look at this examination. These were the ones that were eating and, and drinking of this in an unworthy manner. Verse 28 says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat and eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So you and I, when we come to this moment in time, we have to examine ourselves. Now, to the best of my knowledge, you, you all look pretty sober this morning. I, I, or or, or are you good actors and actresses? I don't know. Maybe you did all the preventive measures so you'd look just right before you came. I don't know. But I, I'm, I'm assuming you all are sober. And I'm assuming that you all, some, some of you got out of bed just shortly before you got here, so you didn't even have a chance to be gluttonous. 
Unless you ate too much out in the foyer. I don't know. But maybe you came here maybe with the wrong motive. Maybe with the wrong attitude. It's easy for us sometimes to come here and fake it till we make it. Now don't nobody look at me like I've never done that in in church, Matthew. (laughs) I've done it. And I've been a pastor and a worship leader. Can you believe it? I've done it. I hate to say that, I don't brag, but I've done it. Sometimes we we come and we approach this flippantly. Like, oh yeah, here we go again, another Lord's Supper service. Whoop de do. That's the case. We have our time of prayer before we go into this. We need to say, Lord, search me. I've come today with the wrong motives, but I'll lay the wrong motives at your feet. And I, I, I want to come with a fresh, fresh perspective and fresh appreciation for what Christ did on the cross for me. Verse 29. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So there are effects, immediate effects, in other words, of this gluttonous behavior. Verse 30, For this reason many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. These people that were getting drunk at these love feasts, some of those, and their gluttonous and their drunkenness, some even died. Can you imagine such a mess as that church was experiencing? So verse 31 says, If if we would judge ourselves, that's discern or examine ourselves, we would not be judged. We need to start in the mirror. We need to go and look at ourselves, and and I need to look and say, Matthew, okay, is everything where it needs to be? Am I doing things with the right motives? And if I'm not, uh, there there needs to be a plan of correction. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we're judged, we are chastened by the Lord. Those of us who are children of God, Hebrews says that we're going to endure chastening. He's going to discipline us when we got off course. But when we're judged, we're chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Now just go back in your mind to this love feast here. The, the, The church was gathering together and because of their gluttonous behavior, I mean, they, they weren't waiting around for the church to gather as a whole. I mean, it was like, oh, I know there's supposed to be a hundred of us here, only 15. I'm hungry. <laughs> I mean, they were diving in. Paul says, wait for one another. You need to exercise some self control here. But if anyone's hungry, Let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. That last statement tells me something. That the Corinthian church had a whole lot more that Paul wanted to address. But anybody still write letters in here? If, if, if you are a writer, maybe, maybe now you do so by email or by text. There are some things that in written form you do not address. And if you do, it's not very wise. And some of you know that because you messed up. Paul had the wisdom to know he had more to address. And rather than address it by this letter... Or if he were a modern believer, email, text, whatever other form, there were some things that had to be addressed in person. And he said, the rest I will set in order when I come. 
I can only imagine what all that was, and some, some of that was addressed, I'm sure, in 2 Corinthians. But my question to you this morning, where are you? I'll say I'm right here, 3,000 Midway Road. No, spiritually, your motives, your, your heart, where, where are you? Have you come here this morning and maybe you're getting ready to partake of the Lord's Supper and maybe motives just aren't right. Maybe you come here, you're heavy burdened today. You've got things going on and you're distracted. Your mind's just not here and we're going to give you a chance in just a moment to get your perspective where it needs to be. Because we all get there at times. But maybe you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the reality of the Lord's Supper won't mean anything to you. And you can be saved today. So I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. As I encouraged a moment ago, just praying, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts. If there be any wicked way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. If there's something you need to lay at the Lord's feet today, just lay it down. God already knows it anyway, it's just, it's just helping you to just get it off your chest. But God, I, I, I've been flipping about spiritual matters. God, I don't want to do that anymore. Beginning today, I just I want to take it more seriously. I'm just going to ask you to quiet your heart. I'm going to ask Buddy if he come and just play softly in the background. Just, look, just let the Lord examine your heart. Lord, I, I can't get over them. The fact that Jesus took my sin, the sin of the whole world, to the cross. Died a death that I deserve to die. Paid a price that I deserve to pay. But in His grace and mercy and in His great love, He did this for us. Lord, as we get ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper here in a moment, I, this is my prayer. May each second as we celebrate this, may it be, may we remember what you saved us from, what you saved us to. And with a heart of deep gratitude and thanksgiving, partake of the bread and cup. So Lord, thank you for this moment in time. And we can come together and say thank you for the cross. So thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for the shed blood. We we'll ask now if our elders would come forward. It's going to remain in an attitude of prayer for just a moment.
Lord, we love you. Thank you that you first loved us. May we have a sweet time as we commune with you and you with us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture says, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord, for the body and blood of Christ. Lord, we pray your blessing as we partake and reflect. Scripture says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. As we close the service today, there, uh, there was something those early disciples did as they closed out their time together. Closed with a song. So I'm going to ask you to stand. And uh, just a cappella, we're going to break out into a verse of, uh, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. As you go from here today, go thankful for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus.